Hello and welcome to all of you. You're watching Tech24, France 24's tech show. Gaming technology is helping scientists trying to protect the world's coral reefs. We tell you how researchers are mapping corals, charting their health, and even finding remedies without stepping out of the lab. And as bikes are taking over city mobility, we give you an easy way to secure your vehicle. The Invoxia Bike Tracker will alert you in real time in case of suspicious movement or attempted theft. But first, women's health apps are raising privacy concerns again. The British NGO Privacy International has just released its findings that some menstruation apps are sharing users' intimate details with Facebook without them knowing. Well, for more on this, I'm joined by the author of the report, Eva Bloom Dumonte. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. So tell us, what did you find when you started investigating all these period tracking apps? Well, so initially, uh, the first batch of apps we looked at, uh, which are the ones that are most commonly known in Europe, like Clue and Flow, we didn't find anything that was actually too problematic. Uh, the really sort of interesting, and I would say, frankly, horrific uh, data sharing practices we started noticing uh, was when we started looking at apps that were a little less well-known, uh, like uh, Maya by Placal Tech and Mia by uh, Mobile Development and Limited. And this is where we started noticing uh, that essentially all the data that was, uh, that was being collected by those apps was being shared not only with Facebook, but also with other third parties. Now, Eva, more precisely, what type of information does the app ask of its users and what kind of information can it then infer on that basis, sometimes perhaps for commercial use? Well, this is where it's like menstruation apps are particularly interesting. And that was actually what prompted us to look at those apps in particular, uh, because when you use a menstruation app, it's not strictly uh, your menstruation cycle uh, that will be collected. Uh, the app requests all sorts of information about a woman's sexual life. Uh, when you have your last intercourse, was it protected or unprotected, unprotected sex? Uh, there's a lot of lifestyle questions. How much coffee do you drink? How many uh, cigarettes do you smoke? Uh, and there is also like we even had an app that was asking questions about like masturbation, for example. So there's like really very intimate data, very granular data uh, that's being collected and that we noticed uh, was being shared uh, with Facebook. Now, there's also apps that merely just tell Facebook uh, when someone is opening the app or using the app without showing more data. But strictly, even just based on this, based on knowing that someone is using this app, uh, that's already a lot of information for Facebook to have. It's especially relevant because uh, the, the, the worth of the data of pregnant women, for example, uh, is a lot higher than um, the rest of the population, uh, just because we know that purchasing habits of pregnant women change. So merely knowing that a woman it might be using this app to try and conceive uh, is already very important uh, information for a company like Facebook, for example, uh, which is an advertiser. Now, all this transfer of information happens through a tool called the Facebook Software Development Kit, the SDK. How does it work precisely? Well, essentially, those apps are, are using this app, are using this tool, uh, this tool, the Facebook SDK, uh, in order to let Facebook uh, manage and handle the data for them. Uh, so they can uh, they can get essentially uh, information about their customers uh, because they, uh, Facebook does the work of. Uh, of handling and managing uh, the data for them. So essentially they rely on Facebook almost like a contractor through this tool. Uh, they say, here is all our data. Uh, we let you handle it, we, we let you manage it. And when we want to draw intelligence, for example, about, uh, about our customers, we know we can count on you. That, that's essentially how, uh, how the tool works. Uh, and this is why they also rely on companies like AppsFlyer, for example, or CleverTap, which are um, smaller companies that essentially do a similar service of managing the data on behalf of those apps. Eva Bloom Dumonte, thank you very much indeed for that. 
Moving on now to a whole other story. Tropical coral reefs are the most diverse marine ecosystems on Earth, giving shelter to thousands of animal species. But faced with multiple stresses like overfishing and human pollution, over 50% of the world's coral reefs have died in the last 30 years, and up to 90% may die within the next century. So to map, record, and study these reefs, scientists are now turning to gaming technology. Deep under the ocean off Japan's Okinawa Islands, scientists map coral beds. They're part of the 100 Islands program, charting and assessing the health of coral all over the world. Swimming back and forth along the reef, a scientist holds a camera to collect images of the entire plot. This is the result. This is a virtual reality. This is a reef. It's a three-dimensional reconstruction of a reef. These 3D models are created by stitching together the images recorded on site, but now computer software designers and engineers are going even further by creating the data, algorithms and tools that allow scientists to virtually explore and track reefs in the lab. Something we, we work on a lot is, is virtual access, this idea of providing access to sites uh, that are otherwise inaccessible or, or difficult to get to. Vid Petrovic says his work is only possible thanks to rapid development in the video game sector. We get to take advantage of, 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 of the just the ridiculously powerful hardware that exists because of games. The little, you know, extra bits of benefit in, in, in terms of uh, you know, human interface devices and stuff like that that have been developed. Uh, and there are also a lot of the, the software techniques, algorithmic techniques that are useful. But it turns out that, that, that we end up having to kind of change everything a little bit since the goal is, is slightly different. It means scientists are now able to measure the effects of coral bleaching as pollution and rising temperatures put the reef ecosystems at risk. We collect imagery that creates three-dimensional models of the coral reef that we revisit through time to watch individual corals live, die, grow and shrink. The 100 Island Challenge hopes to raise awareness about the importance of coral reefs. More than 500 million people depend on the diverse ecosystems for food and services. And to learn more about this, we're going to welcome our in-house expert, Dan and Jake Hadelkar. Hello, Dan. Hello, Julia. So we all know that when it comes to conservation, one key element is, of course, education. And some games have been, video games have been developed to help raise awareness about the pollution of the world's oceans. Well, yes, one such game is called The Big Catch, and your mission in this game is to clean up the ocean with the help of an extremely rare and endangered species, uh, which is called Rikita porpoise, and you are supposed to collect plastic waste, you navigate this fish through the ocean. It's an easy game, you avoid obstacles and keep on navigating. But the idea behind the game is to raise awareness about the problems of uh, ocean pollution, and there are some interesting bits of information, like millions of tons of plastic are deposited in the, sea, in the seas uh, every year. Then the second game is called Dumb Ways to Kill the Ocean, in which an animated character uh, collects, uh, or you help this animated character collect plastic waste uh, from the ocean. Then uh, there's also a focus on the global warming issue in which the oceans are getting warmer as well. Uh, in that particular segment, you have to unscramble, the, uh, unscramble a word. And in the third section, it talks about the coral reefs where you're supposed to paint a coral um, reef. And it talks about how it takes centuries for coral to grow, but it can be wiped out in a matter of weeks. Now, another key element to try to save endangered species is, of course, to try to boost the sexual reproduction. And when it comes to that, there was a breakthrough for the sexual reproduction of corals in Florida. Well, that's right, Julia. This was the first time that the endangered Atlantic pillar coral was spawned by using lab-induced techniques. Uh, scientists mimic a natural environment in order to make this possible. Now, scientists are hoping that this breakthrough will help to save the extinction of uh, this particular coral. And now new techniques are being devised for a quicker way of assessing the status of coral reefs. Well, yes, scientists at the University of Hawaii at, at uh, Manoa Department of Biology have developed a new technique to determine the amount of coral that's present on a reef by just uh, doing a DNA analysis of a small sample of water. You know, all aquatic um, creatures, they expel the DNAs, including uh, coral, and the scientists are able to determine which corals, which reefs are rich with corals and which are not. And this helps them to, for example, track changes uh, in the coral life health 
and as well as determine the composition of a, a coral reef over a period of time. Dan and Jay Kattelkar, thank you very much indeed for that. We're going to move on to Test 24. With the individual use of bicycles constantly on the rise in cities around the world, it makes sense to take some anti-theft measures. And Dan, today you're showcasing a very simple solution. Well, yes, it's a normal reflector which you can attach uh, to a bike, but inside it is a chip, a device that will help you to track the bike uh, through an application. Now you can create a virtual geofencing, for example. So the moment your bike gets out of that particular zone, you'll get an uh, alert. You can also have an anti-theft alert. So if the bike uh, is supposedly being stolen, then you get an alarm as well. Now this GPS, it lasts uh, between one and three months and it can be recharged in uh, less than 60 minutes. It is waterproof and there's no limit of distance uh, to this GPS. And even though, if you, even though the bike is not being stolen, you can still monitor where your bike is. Now, this is one of the solutions that has been developed by the French company Invoxia. There are similar trackers for pets as well. And how much does it cost? It costs 150 euros. Thank you, Dan and Jay Cattlecar there. It brings us to the end of this week's edition of Tech24, but you can watch it again on our website, france24.com. See you next time.